So we are going to start today with Dr. Econs. And the title of his talk is XLH, a brief history from VDRR to XLH to FGF 23. Um, all welcome, Dr. Econs. Thank you. I, I, um, I was wondering why I get to do the history talk. And I realize that as the oldest member of the group here, uh, I've been around I for the history. We have to get behind the podium. Behind the podium. Oh, we don't like that. OK. <laughs> and uh, what, I, what I, we're going to start out with here is this cartoon. And uh, fortunately for us, this has not happened for XLH. And as I go through some of the history, what I want you to realize is that there's a whole bunch of people mostly funded by the National Institutes of Health, who have contributed over the years to XLH research and, and research in this area in general, and we're standing on their shoulders. The things that are going to be available in the future are because of the, the folks that have done this in the past. And we're going to start way back in 1937 with the discovery of vitamin D, okay? And uh, this uh, paper here, which was uh, in the German literature, and I have put down here that anybody who heckles me is, gets to translate that paper for us, uh, for the entire group, okay? But, uh, but a couple things, actually, about this. One, this was, this was huge because it actually identified vitamin D. The, this led to, essentially, a cure for nutritional rickets. And it was thought that this would cure everybody of rickets. And um, the other uh, point here is that since 1930s, um, back uh, in the 30s, if you were a scientist or a physician and you really wanted to know your stuff, you learned German and French because that's where all the literature was. The United States didn't start leading in science until much later. And let's not take that for granted. So as a country, we've done a tremendous amount over the past several decades in upping the science for the world, okay? And we cannot take that for granted. We need to continue uh, doing that. So vitamin D-resistant rickets, how do we come up with that terrible term? It turned out that we thought we had this great cure for all of rickets with vitamin D. And then, but there were some kids, not very commonly, who would not be cured even with high doses of vitamin D. And this was unfortunately termed vitamin D resistant rickets because it didn't respond to the usual doses of vitamin D. And almost all of those patients probably had XLH. So um, in 1957, Robert Winters and the group at UNC first published that this was an, if you looked at phosphate as the key thing, not the rickets, but phosphorus, blood phosphorus, this was an X-linked dominant disease. So that was a huge uh, item that helped us later on find the gene and do all these things that have happened over, the, over time. So if you looked at blood, the blood phosphorus as your key thing, it was an X-linked dominant disorder. It took a really long time for this to catch on. And, it, and the disease was referred to vitamin D resistant rickets for dec decades. And I'm gonna uh, move here to um, what is an X-linked dominant disease? Because I think it's very important for everybody to know that. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to get out here uh, because I can't see what's on the screen, and I'm going to have to use my pointer here to show you what's going on. But this is a slide that illustrates about X-linked dominant disease. And I'm sorry if we're being televised, but you'll have to move your camera. So, a man has an X chromosome and a Y, and a woman has two X's. One of these X's in each cell is shut off when it's a man, okay? So, uh, but when you go to make sperms and eggs, uh, the man will give an X to all of his daughters or, and a Y to all of his sons, okay? So if the X that he has is, it, 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 it is, is normal, he's giving the normal, the non-XLH allele to all of his kids. The mother here who has this XLH mutation, actually XLH is up here, by the way, for the X, but this was the slide at the time, 
he's going to give that, she's going to give one or the other of these chromosomes to her kids. So each kid has a 50-50 chance. Might be a little bit. Okay. Each kid's going to have a 50-50 chance of getting the disease. So this son got her non-XLH allele here, so he doesn't have XLH. This daughter got mom's XLH here, okay? Now, it, and so a, a woman's going to give it to roughly, each child's going to have a 50-50 chance of getting the disease, so approximately 50% of the children, but it's like a coin toss. You can toss the coin three times and get all heads or get all tails, right? So we come over here in the dad, okay? So if the dad's got the XLH mutation here, if he gives his Y, which is, doesn't have any mutations on it, he's going to have boys. So he, there's not going to be a father-to-son transmission here because in order to have a son, the woman here is going to give one of her two Xs. In this case, they're both normal. So it doesn't matter. The boys are going to be normal here, okay? They, or not have XLH. The, 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 the girls, though, in order to make a girl, you have to have an X from the dad. So all of the daughters are going to have XLH. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay, because that's kind of key, and I'm going to trip over a wire here and get a fracture. Um, so, all right, back to vitamin D resistant rickets. Again, why is all of this important? In the 1960s, and I had to go back and review this several years back, um, and so I went back to medical textbooks from the 1960s. I was not practicing medicine in the 1960s. I was alive, but I wasn't practicing medicine, okay? So I went back to those textbooks, and they were using recommended therapy in the textbooks was up to 500,000 units of vitamin D a day, of regular vitamin D. Okay, now the RDA for vitamin D is four to 800 units. So a half a million units is a ton, okay? And, 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 and this, was, this was because it was D-resistant so if, you, if a little bit of D didn't work, you just pound them with more, okay? Well, what's the problem with that? Vitamin D is fat soluble, and it's got a really long half-life, and that means if you give too much, you have to live with that for weeks. And sometimes what happened is that blood calcium would really rise up, and you could knock out kidneys. And if you knock out your patient's kidneys, they're not happy with you, okay? So, um, so this was kind of more of a dangerous therapy. Eventually what happened, because we recognized, or the physicians at the time recognized that it was phosphate losing, people started adding phosphate uh, to the regimen. And in 1972, Francis Glorio, who's still working today, still contributing, uh, published a paper, a very influential paper, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a top journal, showing that if you added phosphate to the then pretty high doses of vitamin D, again, 50,000 units a day, okay, so that's way higher than a replacement dose, you could get um, uh, some improved therapy that, that the kids straightened out. It wasn't a cure, but the kids straightened out. Okay, now we make kind of the, a, a little bit more of a transition. In the 70s and 80s, people are starting to realize that this is phosphate is kind of key here. Uh, phosphate becomes standard therapy, and then calcitriol, which had been discovered a while back, which, which is the, what your body makes the potent, uh, your body makes vitamin D into a potent hormone called calcitriol or 1,25 dihydroxy vitamin D. Kind of complicated, okay? And it's regulated by your kidney. Now, it turns out in XLH, you don't quite make enough. So if you gave high-dose calcitriol plus the phosphorus, you got a lot better therapy. It worked better. And the second thing is calcitriol's short half-life. So it doesn't hang around for weeks. That's why you have to take it twice a day, right? And the advantage of that is if one of us overdoses you a little bit, you don't go around for weeks with high calcium. And, and, and so we can stop it, and your calcium can come down. So it's a safer therapy than what was that then we're giving out in the 60s and 70s. And when I came on the scene in the 80s, 
this was kind of already um, uh, a growing uh, therapy, and many of you were switched to this uh, in the 1980s. The other development here that occurred in 1976 was the first description of the hype mouse, which is a mouse that spontaneously got XLH. It has, as a matter of fact, the same mutation in the, uh, in the PEX gene that XLH patients have, okay, or one of them. Um, and this turned out to be incredibly useful for science. And I'll just give you one example of why this was useful. Okay? When I started um, in the mid-'80s, it was thought that this disease was a kidney defect because you'll waste phosphorus in your urine. Therefore, it has to be something wrong with the kidney. And my mentor and a, and a, and a friend of mine, Terry Nesbitt, and, and my mentor, Mark Dresner, did an experiment where they took the hype mouse, and they took a kidney out of the hype mouse and transplanted it into a normal mouse. And lo and behold, that kidney didn't lose phosphorus. It functioned perfectly normal. And when you do the converse experiment, and you take a normal kidney, and you put it in the height mouse, it wastes phosphorus. So the defect wasn't transferred or corrected by the kidney. And that was our first clue. There was actually one other paper. But the, these two papers were our first clues that this had nothing to do with the kidney. Yes, the kidney was wasting phosphorus, but it wasn't a primary kidney defect. So transplanting a kidney, for example, into an XLH patient isn't going to work because it's not your kidney that's giving you the problem, okay? This animal model allowed us to do a lot of things, and I don't have time to go through everything. So I'm just going to go through a couple features. I think you all kind of have lived this, most of you. Um, so short stature, as, as Becky uh, noted, and, and lower extremity deformity, specifically bowed legs and not knees. Many of you have experienced bone pain from osteomalacia. Um, I think many of you have experienced And because it's not a focal bone pain, you can't take one finger and point, I hurt right here for the most part. Your doctors tend to blow you off because what happens is we've been taught that you should be able to pinpoint where your, fing where your pain is with one finger. Okay? Osteomalacia kind of hurts all over in the bones. As I don't have to tell you that, right? Uh, but I do tell doctors this a lot. And, um, and then enthesopathy, which Carolyn's going to talk about, so I'm not going to spend too, any time on it. And then pseudofractures, partway through fractures, and I'm going to show you a picture of a pseudofracture in a minute. The incidence is 1 in 20,000, which may sound rare, but if you think of a city like Indianapolis, which has got a million people in it, that gives you a bunch of XLH patients, doesn't it? So it's not that rare of a disease, okay? It's, 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 it's actually um, uh, not that rare, okay? And then there's one point I really want to stress here, that even within the same family, people have the exact same mutation. There is tremendous variability between one patient and the other. So I have witnessed families. Um, I, I have seen, when I, before I left North Carolina, I had seen over 200 patients with XLH. And, and I have seen families where one brother, and I knew they were both affected because I had their phosphorus values. One brother would be this tall and the other brother was this tall. And the one that was this tall had bowed legs and classic XLH and fairly severe disease. And the other brother had minimal problems. Okay? And just because one person has a severe disease doesn't mean their kids are going to have severe disease. And just because you have mild disease doesn't mean your kids are going to have mild disease. It just doesn't work that way. Now, you know, dominant diseases in general, you have a lot of variability. And one time I was asking uh, Mike Keneally, who's a world-famous geneticist here at, at IU, years back. You know, I really, sometime before I die, I want to understand why XLH patients and my other patients with other dominant diseases why there's such variability in the severity? And he, he, he looked at me and he said, Michael, no gene is an island. So all the other 20,000 genes that make up your what's going on affect whether you're going to be severe or affected. And we really don't have a good handle on that yet. So as promised, I'm going to show you a pseudofracture, OK? And this person, this is a younger gentleman who has a pseudofracture here. 
and down here. And what these are are partway through fractures with a whole lot of reaction around them. It's trying to heal, but they don't heal. And actually, these we can actually heal with our current therapies. Okay, but but you can see these do sometimes frequently hurt. But you could see why, if you're me or if you're you, you worry that maybe this thing will break right off. That's happened. It, it's not that common, but. I do treat people with these things because treatment in adults is, is a controversial issue, but not for folks who have problems like this. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit closer to modern times. And uh, my life from 1987 to 1995, my fellowship project when I started my fellowship was find the gene. And we thought this could be done like everything else could be done in you know, a shorter period of time. It turned out by 1995, we had a five lab international consortium that found the gene. So five labs from around the world working on this to find this gene. Um, and uh, the reason why we did this is one, it would provide us knowledge about your disease and knowledge that we could hopefully use to do something and secondly, it would provide us a better understanding of normal phosphate homeostasis. And the inherent assumption in that was that the gene responsible played a role in normal phosphate homeostasis. Well, it's a good thing they don't make you give back your fellowship certificate after you, after you do it, because we're not at all clear on this point here, okay? We may have been dead wrong about that, but clearly we did find the gene uh, the way we found it, um, actually, it was by going to families. And we held family reunions. We still do this for some diseases, not so much for exhalation now. And some of you may have participated in some of our family reunions. And um, we, we got blood samples from everybody. We found out who has the disease and who doesn't. And then we mapped it. Came back to the lab and used molecular biology techniques to map it. And I mostly show this because it proves that I had black hair at one time, okay? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've been in, involved in this for a while. And we'll, so we found PEX, and this is a cartoon of PEX. And this is, the, this is the gene that if you mutate this gene, you get XLH, okay? And why am I showing this? It turns out there are over 300 different mutations. And what they all do, they all ruin the protein, okay? So this is kind of a knockout. You get a mutation in this thing, regardless of what kind of mutation it is, and it makes this gene not work, okay? And there's a couple other things that are really kind of cool here I'm gonna show you, okay? So this thing is in the membrane of the cell, and the vast majority of this protein sticks out from the cell. So it's not inside the cell, it's outside, anchored by this one anchor here to the membrane. And it's a member of this enzyme class. And what these enzymes do is they Proteins come by and they cleave small proteins. So, okay, so now we have something that causes your disease. That's thought to be an enzyme. It's at least a member of this enzyme protein class. And it's supposed to cleave small proteins as they float past. So hold on to that thought because we're going to move transiently to a different disease. This is autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets. And it's very much like XLH. People present very similar order, at least if they present in childhood, just like XLH. It's very rare, okay? And it's autosomal dominant, it's not X-linked. So we knew it was a different, fundamentally different disease. And this gentleman has a windswept deformity, so it looks like his legs are swept. That's not real common, but it does happen. And the, the mutations that cause this disease occur in fibroblast growth factor 23, or FGF23. And importantly, it has nothing to do with fibroblasts, and it's not a growth factor. So why do we call it FGF23? Because it's part of this protein class. And it's not, it, it's, 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 there's a whole bunch of FGFs, and it's FGF number 23. And what it does is a hormone, and Dr. Immel's gonna explain this better than me, but it tells the kidney you got too much phosphorus, you need to dump the phosphorus. And the kidney starts dumping the phosphorus. And it also decreases production of, of, of the calcitriol. 
So in the setting of a low phosphorus, your calcitriol level should be high because that helps you absorb phosphorus and calcium, and it's actually normal or low. So it's inappropriately normal or low, okay? And in ADHR, what happens is the mutations protect, um, protect, they, they prevent this protein from being cleaved. So normally, uh, if you make too much FGF23, you cleave it and you inactivate it. In, in ADHR, you can't inactivate it, so you get too much. You get too much buildup. Well, what about XLH? We're going to go back to XLH because this is a talk on XLH. And I just, this is some data from Tom Carpenter that I took. And XLH patients have high FGF23 levels. These are untreated adults and children. And here are normal people, or people who don't have XLH, excuse me. And the levels of FGF23, two to three fold higher, sometimes much higher. Okay? So the logical question is, aha, PEX must, must cleave FGF23. We've got the answer. Okay? A brilliant idea shot down by an ugly fact. Uh, it turns out PEX doesn't cleave FGF23 at all. Okay, it turns out that both PEX and FGF23 are made in bone. And what happens is when you don't have PEX, you make too much FGF23, you overproduce it. And so that's why you have high levels. And that explains why this is an X-linked dominant disease, because in a woman, half of her cells are the the the... PEX muta mutated uh, gene is shut off, and the other half, it's turned on. Those cells where it's turned on are making a lot of FGF23, and that's why women get this disease. And women get as severe disease, for the most part, as men. Kind of interesting. Okay. So just to sum up here, it's an X-linked dominant disorder with a prevalence or an incidence of about 1 in 20,000. High FGF23 levels lead to isolated phosphate wasting, so you, you urinate out too much phosphorus, and you have inappropriately normal or low calcitriol levels. It results in rickets, which results in the bowed legs or the knock knees, and osteomalacia, which gives you a whole lot of bone pain. And you know better than I that short stature, lower extremity deformities, Tooth abscesses, which we didn't go into today, but some of our patients, despite great dental care, have 12 and 13 root canals. Um, I'm sure if we went around the room, we'd find that many of you put your dentist kids through college, right? Um, and, um, and, 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 but I want to point out that a whole lot of progress has been made over the years. And, um, and, and to a great extent, it's because of people like Carol and Eric and a bunch of others who have dedicated their careers to furthering research in this disease. So, and on that note, I'm going to end here, and I'm going to hope you don't feel like this poor fellow, and I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to take questions because we have a little extra time for questions. Questions, comments, anything? Yes. So, so the treatment in adults um, is, is difficult in some respects. So there's all, with, anytime you give me, any kind of medical therapy, there's cost versus um, benefits. And the cost you have to consider are the side effects of the therapy. I'm not talking about financial costs. They're there. But the side effects of the therapy versus the benefit to the patient. And in a, in a child who you want to grow and develop normally, and without having bowed legs so they don't need operations for osteotomies, et cetera, it's a little bit more clear-cut. In adults, it's a little less clear-cut because not every adult has a whole lot of symptoms. So um, I've written a few chapters on this, and there's one of them where I really poured my heart out about this. I wrote a bunch of pages. And so you really have to sit down with the patient, and some of the folks in the audience are actually my patients here because uh, I see adults. Um, and, and decide if the costs are worth the benefits. So in people who have pseudo-fractures, we treat them. In, in people who have 
very, you know, who have a lot of bone pain. Now, not joint pain from the anthesopathy, because our current treatment we don't think helps the anthesopathy. But, but if you have bone pain from the osteomalacia, I will frequently treat those folks. And we really sit down and talk with them about what are the pluses and minuses, because the treatment, um, some of you know, you're seeing me a whole lot. Right? You're getting blood and urine very frequently because I'm going to watch you like a hawk because I don't want to hurt your kidneys. I don't, there are potential parathyroid problems from the therapy. Many of you have had um, secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism, overactive parathyroid glands from the therapy. Now, it's a little bit weird because in XLH, the parathyroids are a little overactive to begin with. Why that is, um, is hard to explain. I mean, it would, I, I, we just, I just submitted a grant on this, okay? <laughs> uh, so we're gonna really be studying this in, uh, quite a bit. I think, uh, frankly, I think a lot of our scientists are off in their feelings about what FGF23 does to parathyroid hormone. But in XLH, what has been observed for 30 years is that before treatment, the parathyroids tend to be a little overactive. And our treatment makes that worse. So, so it's a cost-benefit thing, and you really do need to sit down and with your doctor or find somebody who's willing to sit down with you and kind of talk about what are the costs, what are the benefits, is this worth doing? Because it, it really doesn't help anybody to treat you for six months and then you stop therapy. And because it's a big commitment to get into it, both as a patient and as a physician. We had a couple other questions somewhere here. You had a question? Um, Um, sure. Actually, th this it doesn't have a whole lot for doctors in it. Um, we've actually, actually, Eric and I, yeah. So, so, so we have a, a paper in the Journal of Clinical uh, Endocrinology and Metabolism, which they're now going to make into a book form. But the our, the papers on XLH, the approach to the hypophosphatemic patient, that goes through it. It's um, and then some of the chapters. Um, I mean. Gosh, I have like a 50-page chapter on this. It's a whole lot for somebody to read. Um, but sure, we're, we're, we're trying to get some information out onto the website. I think we have most of this on our website. You need to dig into under the medical research, and it has for physicians. So there are many layers to the website. Take some time. Go to all the links. Look through what's on there. And the, the other thing I would encourage you to do is if you want therapy, for example, uh, find somebody in your city that has an interest in this because this isn't something that a family medicine physician can do. Okay, There are potential real costs to this. There are situations, I've been consulted, for example, someone with XLH in China, and I want to tell them, don't get treated because the, the risk of therapy, if it's not adequately monitored, which is, was, would be the case in China, is, is much is worse than the disease. So you can't just be given medicines and then told to come back in a year. That's not going to work. And some of you who see me or Eric know that we're kinds of pains. You know, we're bringing in fairly frequently, and it's a pain to come down here. Some of folks are coming from three-hour drives. And it is hard, but we, the, the, the therapy has risks, and you, it, it, there, there's nothing that you can do that's powerful enough to help that isn't also powerful enough to hurt. Thank you. How often, how often do you see your patients? Um, it depends on what phase I'm in. When I'm ramping up, I'm seeing them very frequently. Yes. Uh, as in once or uh, every other month, every month. Every, I've, I've narrowed it down. No, I do more than twice a year, even when you're on stable therapy. I'm probably the most, uh, the worst doctor to see in terms of follow-up, okay? No, no. So, uh, and, and, and I, I, some people are looking at me going, yeah, you really are the worst. Uh, and, but we try to get some blood and urine, uh, et cetera, at home, you know, closer to home. Uh, but I do need to see folks periodically. Some of the phosphate salts, like KFOS Neutral, has a lot, have, a, have a lot of salt in it. So I have to make sure we don't overload you in terms of salt. And if we do that, then we can switch you to KFOS original, but that's kind of yummy tasting. 
Um, you mix that up in water. And I don't know how many of you were on Julie's solution when you were kids. Yeah, that was really yummy, wasn't it? Yeah, we got we had we had a lot of uh, terrific uh, things about that. Other questions? We have another minute. Any other? So that's that that's a potential side effect of getting a big sodium load, and sometimes what we do is is switch to the original. The problem is if you're mixing it up in water, five year olds tend not to like really drink yucky stuff, okay. Um, and so if you can get them to take it, and the website does have uh, hints on how to get medicines into people, into kids in particular. And so I would use that and also talk with the other parents here today to, to see, you know, um, you know, people have used applesauce. They've used a, a variety of, of, of things to get it into a kid. So our son takes the backpack powder. Uh -huh. And he loves it. He's gotten wonderful after everything they recommended. He actually, for the last two years, has also been really good. He dumps the powder directly in his mouth. And he drinks the water afterwards. And his doctor said that he should go concentrate. Okay. And his levels have been, he's been keeping it all in. And then he drinks okay. the amount of water afterwards. And his doctor, once they, they monitored him, you know, for a while, and he came back to the 